Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, one thing I love about working in marketing and communications is the fact that I've been able to work across a variety of industries, sectors, and types of businesses. You know, part of that is because my own historical need to keep things fresh and exciting, you know, plays a major role in the decisions that I make. And I kind of know that now. But part of it is also because my skills are applicable to pretty much any business. You know, but now I think more in terms of purpose, as in being a communicator means I've got a key role in bringing purpose to life for my company, my colleagues and myself. You know, it took me a really long time to realize that when you throw purpose into the mix, you move from a self-referential and kind of features and benefits based career to one that's based more in service to something bigger than yourself. Purpose is the rocket fuel for your career. Or maybe I should say it's the renewable clean power for your career. You know, at least that's what I think my guest today would say. He's a strategic communications pro, been that way for three decades. He's worked his way up from PR coordinator to communications director, and now to co-founder of a leading edge research and marketing communications consultancy. And through it all, from America to Africa to Europe and Asia, he's been unquestionably driven by a need to improve the lives of others, most recently by doing his part and more to support the energy transition. When I met him, he was leading communications for one of the world's leading offshore wind companies, and now with his new consultancy, Engagement Lab, he and his partners are totally focused on clients who are right in the midst of the green transition, helping them cultivate empathy and trust with their important stakeholders. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the show my friend and former colleague, Michael Morris. Hi, Dan. Michael, good to see you. I How am, are you? I am great. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. Was, was, was that an accurate rendition of the way things stand? <laughs> It was. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well done. Yeah. I think you, uh, I think you encapsulated it perfectly. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about our conversation today you know, for, for on multiple, on multiple levels, because um, everybody out there who, who listens to the show knows that I really dig talk and marketing and communications. And, and of course we share that that's our profession. Um, but I haven't had anybody on who's been an actual legit, like, ex-colleague we've worked together on you know on things for you know for the same company before and uh, when i say that i mean of course i'm referring to mitsubishi heavy industries but uh, in michael's case um it was mhi vestus offshore wind um also known as mval within our little community so michael's working for a subsidiary company or a joint venture company of mitsubishi heavy industries out there in Denmark. And, um, I, I was based of course in the U S and Tokyo. Um, so, you know, we did, we were, while we met a couple times a year, we crossed paths occasionally. Um, we were in regular contact. We worked together on some big projects, really exciting times. Um, and, you know, I got to know Michael and, and certainly mostly at that time, more in the communication side of things, I think. Um, but, um, but really just a experience as a hardcore marketer and just like the knowledge that Michael would bring to to our meetings and to our whole entire global group of marketers was just, you know, I, I can't, can't say how, how much I appreciate you, Michael, for all the input that you had and helped us build a better global team. So thank you very much for that. Um, and you know, that's, that's the kind of, you know, that's, that's opened the door to where you've gone now with founding engagement labs. So, you know, why don't we start off by, first of all, like you've had a really fascinating history. You know, I, I mentioned some of the continents that you've been involved with, which is, basically all of them, I think, except for, I didn't hear Australia or, or, um, or, or Antarctica or, in there, but, or, or Latin America. <laughs> or Latin America. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but I mean, you know, I, you've been all over, I mean, and, you know, looking at the course of your career, it seems like it's very, it's been very purpose driven from the get go. So how'd you get to where you are now? And then we can kind of move into a, a conversation about engagement labs. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. You know, I, I didn't start out in my career, um, you know, just truth, truth be told, um, as, as sort of passionate about working with purpose throughout, uh, 
the, the coming decades. You know, I, I started off like most people coming out of school and wanting to get a good job and, and make decent money and, and have fun doing marketing and, and comms. Um, but, you know, I, I, I took a turn right after graduation in the sort of early 90s um, in Los Angeles. Um, uh, and I was invited out to Ghana in West Africa by a friend of mine who invited me there for a couple months to, to help renovate and rebuild this warehouse uh, at this uh, bookstore chain there in, in Accra, the capital. And, you know, I, I didn't want to, I wasn't ready to get a real job at that point. I'd graduated a couple months earlier. And so I thought that would be fun, a couple months, go out and have a good time. And I literally had tools, hammer, different things in my bag on the plane. This was before 9-11. This was before where you could take yeah. stuff on the plane with you, yeah. you know? And, and so I, I get out there and, and through a number of events that, that I won't go into now, but, but the, the person who invited me was asked to, to leave. There was a big brouhaha and I was standing in the managing director's office, Ghanaian a guy standing in his office about a month into my time there saying, well, I'm here alone now. Do you want me to leave? Do you want me to stay? Uh, what can I, can I help you? I'm going to be here another couple months, but but what would you like me to do? And he said, well, do you, what do you know how to do other than swing a hammer? I said, well, I just graduated with a marketing degree a few months ago, so I could help you with that. He said, yeah, that'd be great. Why don't you nice. uh, assess the situation and see what you can do? So, <laughs> so I did. And I came up with this sort of, you know, some pillars of a marketing plan, uh, best of my ability. I was 22, you know, yeah. and um, a genius. At the time. And he said, yeah, exactly. And so he said, uh, yeah, that's great. Now, can you stay and do it? Can you execute it? Can you stay until it's done? And I had no money and they were not paying me. And so I had to self fund. So I wrote to my buddies back uh, in the U S uh, wow. getting re who were getting real jobs. And, and I said, Hey, I need your support. And one friend, one friend wrote me back and said, as long as you want to be there and do that work, which I love and I support, I will cover you a hundred percent of what you need. It was like $900 a month or something. Yeah. And that covered everything I needed. And he did. He covered all my expenses. And I was there a little over a year. And that started a journey for me. These synchronistic events, as you know, looking back at your life and your career, these moments, these poignant moments and people yeah. that come into your path that set you on a trajectory that is really hard to predict, impossible to predict, really. And and that's what happened for me. And eventually worked my way over through World Vision, which uh, is a great relief and development organization. Traveled around Africa doing a number of marketing photojournalist assignments for several years after that. And then wound my way into agency life supporting NGOs. So the first really half of my career was, is, was spent in the humanitarian NGO world, yeah. um, putting my uh, uh, putting my two cents in, into that space. And, and then really from, from the time I moved to Denmark eight years ago until now, I've, I've been passionate about renewables, wind energy. Denmark is, you know, obviously a pioneer in, in the wind sector. And so, um, and, and so in terms of purpose, you know, you mentioned something, I really like your intro about purpose. I think for me, it's important for us to recognize poignant moments when they happen. And recognize when you're in them and have courage to step into them and also to recognize pivotal people. And I think it's better to believe that things happen for a reason, just so that you're more aware when you meet these instrumental people in your life and you realize you're at a crossroads. And I think that 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 has prompted me to kind of commit to work with purpose and and also the experiences. This last thing I want to say on that, you know, I traveling around with world vision all across africa from the sahara all the way down to south africa to see the the most impoverished the most difficult situations is life changing and i was in my early to mid 20s and i mean it was so formative for me to experience such pain and 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 um struggle and adversity to be right up close and, and see it and witness it and experience that um, to, to some degree with people. And that also changed me. And so I decided at that point that I would really pursue work with purpose. It's interesting. Sometimes, you know, purpose finds you, you don't necessarily find it, but you know, I, I, every, almost everything that you've been saying can sort of summarize 
I don't know, 75, 80% of the podcast episodes I've done so far, <laughs> like, you know, this pursuit of purpose or this, uh, you know, the, the idea that, uh, of, of the importance of connection and those pivotal moments. In fact, just the other day, as, as of the time of this recording, um, and probably the, the episode that's going to go before yours, uh, I was, I was, had the pleasure to talk with a, with a fellow named Ken Jacobs, who, you know, is second time on my show. And, um, you know, Ken is like an Uber connector, you know, and bef- not, of course, he's also a, a PR legend and a coach extraordinaire. And, you know, he's had a, an amazing career in life. And, um, you know, I could talk to him for hours. And I did. The thing about it, though, when I started to think about having him on the show was the words I used were pivotal people. And he's one of them, you know, through your life through the times. And if there's any advice that, and I, and I have been asked, I'm at the stage of my life where people actually ask me, Hey, you know, do you have any advice for the youngsters? I'm like, what? Right. You're asking me? <laughs> We're there but if I, if, <laughs> when they do ask, it's something that you just said, be open to those connections, right? You just don't know. And every, every person that you meet is a whole new door to who knows what else. The issue though, is you don't want to approach the person like, okay, here's a guy who's going to help me with opportunities. It's just that matter of being open to a connection and, you know, really understanding and approaching it from a human side. And that's something that I know you've been really passionate about for a long time is, you know, we talked about, you you mentioned renewable energy, offshore wind, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, but underlying a lot of this and all of this is this kind of human to human, um, connection, the, the, the desire to just make other people better and thereby help other people get better and thereby become better yourself is I think kind of something that's there and has been there for a long time. You know, putting my armchair psychologist back where it belongs in the box. I mean, I, I just, I can't agree more. I mean, I just, I, I, you've describing things that I've come to as, as well in my thinking, but, but I came later in life to that. I, like in my twenties, I was just about you know, hey, I'm in Japan. I love Japan. Hey, you know, um, but right, right. I didn't really mind what I was doing or where I was doing. It's like, am I here? My purpose was just to be there. It wasn't anything yeah. grandiose. Y- yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is, I mean, for, for, I, I, you, you said it so well. I mean, it doesn't, it, it finds you. And so yeah. for me, it found me early on. And I didn't plan that. I had no idea. All I wanted to do was go to West Africa for a couple months and swing a hammer. And then all of a sudden, things are happening. I'm making decisions and then off you're off and running on your, on your career. Yeah. And so the, and, and the funny story about how I got into world, world vision and traveling around for, for that organization. So we're sitting in a marketing meeting with our agency and there's probably eight or 10 people sitting around this conference table. And I, I worked my way into a, a decent marketing role at world vision at that time. So we're sitting there with our ad agency and all the people that travel and do photojournalistic assignments are in the room and they sort of say, okay, we're pretty dry on resource the next six to 12 months for, you know, stories, campaigns, photos, video work. We need to go out and get some fresh material. It's time. Nobody raises their hands. Nobody (laughs) says I'm in, nobody says I'm going. Everyone's a little bit older than me. I'm around 25 at this time. And I look around the room and I'm seeing opportunity because no one is stepping forward. And so I slowly, you know, raise my hand like, um, I'll go. <laughs> I'll do that. If you want me to go to the Sahara for six weeks and and do this, I'm game. So that just that one day, that one moment, that pivotal moment mm-hmm. started the next several years of travel around Eastern Europe and all around the continent of Africa with crews and and seeing this stuff up close, it just, you can't help but be changed by it. You can't because we weren't going to these places and having fancy meetings and fancy dinners and hotels. We were going out into the middle of nowhere to see the worst places because that's where World Vision is working. And, you know, it, it, it's just a shout out to World Vision too. I mean, because you're talking about, you know, 20 something years ago, um, even today, they're a very important organization. and and I would like to just recognize them a little bit. And just because in my day job, you know, working for, working for Elixir these days, um, 
job I love, you know, not the purpose that I set out to do, but the purpose that I can definitely get on board with, um, you know, improving sanitation around the world, improving water around the world. Like these are important things, you know, through the products that we have, but also really just, it's what we want to do. And like the products are, are a means to an end. They're not the end itself. Um, but world vision is one of our great partners. And, um, you know, we've done a tremendous, we've been doing a tremendous amount of work with them for ages and ages. And the, the scenes that you're describing or the things that you're talking about from your travels in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, I've never been, um, but I've heard those stories quite often. They're, they're riveting, um, extremely heart kind of, they tug on the heart in ways that you wouldn't, or they should, if they don't, then you've, then you've, you're lacking something in your, in your psyche. Uh, but you know, the fact that so many children every day are dying from diarrhea, what kind of world, you know, you, I just go to, if I ever, if that ever happens to me, grab some rice or I go to, a, I go to get a, get a quick pill and I'm fine. You know, I mean, little, but kids are dying in Africa for something simple like that. So, you know, it's an important, it's a very important uh, mission. And thank you for, 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 for your work there at, at World Vision, but that sets you on a path, you know, sort of, I didn't mean to do a commercial for World Vision, but they're great. And anybody out there, if you have a, if you're looking for some place to, to kind of, you know, devote some time or funds, you can check them out. But um, the, um, those pivotal people, those pivotal moments, you know, something else occurred to me while you're saying that. And, and, you know, maybe we're diverting a little bit here, but this human to human contact, this concept of just being with people, um, you were in a room with a group of people and serendipity kind of came along, right? You, this opportunity came and you just raised your hand and the timing was right. You know, you, you had the capability to up and go. Um, everybody's at a different stage in their life at different times, but that doesn't mean that serendipity isn't going to come knocking. And I use serendipity, serendipity instead of opportunity um, because, you know, one six and one and a half dozen the other really, but serendipity is really more kind of that, that amazing kind of result from randomness. Uh, you know, I think it's a much more positive thing. So, yeah, I think, um, I think you need to be open to all of your, the connections that you make, the people that you see in, in a way that embraces or even kind of welcomes or looks for serendipity. Yeah, that's and, right. Um, I mean, yeah. Exactly. And that's, that, that's a really good point because as I said, I choose to believe, and I don't have, I mean, I don't have any evidence of this in a real concrete way, but I think it's more just a, maybe a belief system. But I choose to believe that things happen for a reason because if only because then I'm at least more aware of when things happen and who I'm meeting with and who I'm talking to. And not that you are looking to exploit or take advantage of someone, but that you're aware of, you know, I'm in a moment now that's actually a critical moment. And I tell my kids, I have two teenagers and I tell them, look, you know, most days in your life are going to be boring Tuesdays full of very uneventful things going on. <laughs> but every once in a while, you will have these days or these moments or these occasions where it's big. It, what happens in this event or this meeting or this test or uh, this particular situation will set you on a trajectory that is different from the one you're on now. And so to recognize that and to, to say that, you know, things happen for a reason, call it synchronicity, call it mm -hmm. serendipity, there yeah. is meaning behind what happens. And, and I am confident of that. If only in my own experience, I can look back over these 30 years and say, yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's easy to string it all together when you're looking back. Um, but I think that's, that's, uh, that's one thing I would say, you know, to people is, you know, it, recognize those moments when they're happening and you, and you can, if you're open to it. And that's, that's the key right there. And that's the one, that's the, the last thing I wanted to say on this, on this particular topic before we move on something, you know, related, which is it's that openness, right? And, you know, when you, when you're in the field that we're in, 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 in a creative field, you know, um, in a communications marketing where you are, serving something larger than yourself, whether it's an organization or a client, you know, or something else, you know, uh, you're, you you want to, you, you need to tell stories. You need to help that something else to, to, 
to kind of define itself so that so that you can you know persuade or convince or you know otherwise change minds or or you know somehow get the message through to people you never know or have never met i mean in a nutshell that's kind of what we do we 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 help persuade people who are at different stages of 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 a either a, a a buying or learning process uh and a decision process we help them to kind of either nudge them in a certain direction or get the information that they need to make educated decisions. And we want to do that through the power of story and through the power of like power of imagery and through the things that we communicators and marketers really know how to do, you know, for some, some people through, do it through advertising. Some people do it through, you know, podcasts or whatever it is. But the point is, you know, you, you want to get in front of people some way, have them get interested in you, persuade them to do things. You can't do that if you're not open to these moments. You know, the, the, the secret power or the superpower, maybe I think that, that propels people in our, in our line of work or keeps them going in their, in our line of work so that they get to positions of authority or positions of, of responsibility is that ability. I think the ability to, um, to connect dots that nobody else can connect. And if you're open, if you walk around every day thinking, you know, where your, where your brain is open to seeing those things, where every piece of information that comes in, you know, you, you either immediately try to connect it to something else, or you tuck it away to be connected to something else at some point, you know, those connections, that's a mindset, right? That you can cultivate, but I think really needs, you need to have to, to eat, to, to build success in this, in this particular field that we're in. And, and it's powered by empathy, probably. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I was going to connect it to empathy and you're absolutely right. I think the, the foundation of that is empathy and who knows which comes first there, but I think it's related for sure. And, you know, I've always thought that empathy in what we do is obviously critical because you have to connect into your audience. You have to know who you're talking to and kind of what makes them tick and, and all those things. And I don't know about you, but for me, gosh, I mean, I, I, on a day when I do a lot of writing, let's say not just in meetings, but like actual writing, I'm exhausted at the end of that day because I am living in someone else's shoes. You know, I am, I'm trying to just transport myself into someone else's reality. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's really tiring. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like very man, much so. I am just exhausted because, you know, you just, it's a lot of mental energy to do that, but it's so important. It's the heartbeat of, of, of the work that we do when it's done well is really powered by that. It's one of the reasons why it's one of the core elements of our, of our business engagement. Yeah. Lab. Yeah. And just on that, you know, I, I do want to go into get into engagement lab, believe me, the, the, what you said about, about feeling tired after putting yourself in somebody, putting your mind in somebody else's shoes. Like, you know, there are people out there, I think, who are just, they're so naturally empathetic um, that they derive energy from that, you know, and, and they, they go through their day being either so selfless or being so like, like naturally, you know, thinking in, in the other person's shoes that they, at the end of the day, you know, they, they sort of want to do more. Or they feel like, Ooh, I'm exhilarated. I feel exhausted, but it's not because it's not because I'm not jazzed by what I've done. It's probably because, you know, empathy is a cultivated thing for me. Right. Um, and I have to really be mindful of this as I go through what I'm doing, because I know that I could go in the other direction, just switch over to logic and just like kind of shut everything down. If I, you know, if I, if I just kind of let myself do that. Um, so, you know, being on all the time, I think that's what, that's what it is. Like you hear that all the time. I, I was, uh, I'm exhausted because I was on all the time. Um, a lot of introverts say that like when they go out to parties, they go to a party and they're like, oh, exhausted. I was on all the time. Right. I would venture to say that's kind of that's kind of you, Michael, from from, from our from our experiences a little bit. Right. But like, you know, you, you, it doesn't mean you're any less social or any less kind of friendly. It just means like it takes a different set of mental energy. So that's what it's like for me, too, man. I, I if I'm if I am in a particularly like like if, if I am on it, if I'm on 
I will, I will be tired, but it'll be a good, a good exhaustion. It's a good tired. It's, it's yeah. positive energy expended for sure. I agree. Yeah. I've, if it's like the end of a workout, you know, you kind of go, okay, that was a really great yeah. workout. I'm tired, but that was good. Like I, yeah. I need more of that, but I need a break right now. <laughs> well, and, and actually I'm, I'm going to use that to segue into something that we talked about earlier, right? So at the end of a workout, the end of that kind of heavy effort, when you're expending that, that, um, you know, your, your, your empathy and, feel fulfilling mission or in purpose, right? You get a high out of that, right? I mean, you just get, you know, you do, it's you're, you're exhausted because you've expended this effort, but, or you're, you're feeling like jazzed up or high about it, but it's like, it's all about like, you're, you're, you're like the neuroscience there is clear. You are, uh, you're, you're stimulated, you're getting stimulated a certain way and you're create, building up oxytocin in the system, right? Now, before we got on the call here today, Michael was telling me that engagement labs engagement lab sorry is um you know uh, about a year old now and i was going to say oh, the new company engagement lab but it's still kind of new when you think about it but i didn't realize this but you have your, your logo is kind of you know a derivative of the oxytocin molecule um you know we've already we've already been talking about how you said that empathy is sort of at the core of everything but let's bring that to your business and to what you're doing with engagement lab and you know, why, you know, why did you choose that? What is that all about? And what's engagement lab all about? Fill us in. Yeah, no, I engagement lab. Um, I think at its heart is, um, is about facilitating connection between, um, you know, Im important groups of people. So our clients, for example, want to reach, um, a very specific group of people and, and we, we know how to do that. But one of the things that it's important in that process is to recognize what you don't know about your audience. And oftentimes what that is, is sort of a deeper level of human insight. You know, for example, um, how, how does your core audience perceive risk in the world? You know, how, how do, what, do, what are they most afraid of? You know, what inspires them? What, what gets them up in the morning? What keeps them up at night? Those, those sorts of human insights. And so it was really important for us in the beginning and kind of the founding of the company to, to have a lot of conversation around that, around connection and empathy. And the more we started talking about those as, as pillars of the business and how we engage with, with clients in the energy transition, the more we realized that there was a neurological piece to this that would offer a really good reminder for us on a daily basis to make sure that we stay in the right frame of mind. And so that's why we have a, a, a rendering of, of the molecule oxytocin, because it, it is a constant reminder that it is at the heart of what we're doing. And so, especially in a B2B context where oftentimes um, I, like everyone else, uh, we get carried away with a lot of other things and we tend to think of B2B as um, fundamentally different. Um, and I don't see it that way. I think, uh, you probably agree with me here, but I, I think that at the heart of it, it's still people to people it's humans to humans, you know, uh, yes, there's a lot of architecture around it. And there's of course, different buying decisions and behaviors and things, but, but at the end of it, we really wanted to, for ourselves, just to make sure we were, uh, you know, walking the talk that we were reminded and that we were properly engaging with clients and that we were also recommending how they engage with their stakeholders and the groups they want to reach. Um, so it, it was a, it was sort of a practice, what we preach kind of endeavor to really plant that flag at the beginning of the business. Well, okay. And can we step back just a little bit into the, like give a little more context around the business? Cause you mentioned, you know, of course, company, you're helping your clients and who are in the green transition um, and energy transition and the tra transitions, I think a key word here for you. Um, what, so you came out of offshore wind, right? After several, you know, working for several years in the offshore wind and renewables uh, area. Um, and, um, you know, so, and your partners have also have their cred in that space and, and other kind of related areas as well. Um, and you can talk about them if you like, but the, um, the thing I just, I think we want to clarify a little bit for listeners here is, is, you know, who are you working with and what exactly are you trying to get them to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our work is primarily in, um, so 
th- there's two stages to our work and and then then I'll get into kind of who we're doing it for. Mm-hmm. One is at the outset of of every engagement with a client, we'll walk them through a sort of methodology that is research focused and intelligence gathering Mm -hmm. um, at its core. So we're going to uncover whether it's through qualitative or quantitative or both um, insights that are going to be important for the execution of that campaign. And what that campaign looks like, it can be different. One client, for example, we're doing primarily public relations work. Mm -hmm. Another client, we're doing primarily thought leadership work. So a lot of writing, a lot of content generation. Another client, we're doing a lot of different marketing and comms, sort of a general, almost kind of an in-house marketing team uh, kind of function. Um, And another client, we're helping with positioning and it's in a mergers and acquisitions environment. So entities coming together and we're putting together the whole sort of brand positioning package around that. So it's really for us about coming alongside a business in the energy transition. And if you as a business need to engage a group, whether it's internal and, and you're looking to engage employees or external engaging policymakers to help nudge a particular particular piece of legislation, um, or customers or a supply chain supplier group, um, and you need to understand that group better. You need to put a plan together to reach them, to nudge them, as you said earlier. Um, that's what that's what we do. So it's 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 I would say broad in the communication scheme, but it's limited in the sense that we only do engagements that include research up front. So we won't engage with with folks unless they're willing to to sort of understand and, and buy into the value of that. And also it's really um, within the energy transition very specifically. So you have a really good niche or niche, uh, you know, of whichever you, you prefer and um, area of specialization. And, um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. And it seems to be like you're hitting, it could be what, what my, um, and you know, I, I don't think I can go one, any single episode without name dropping Mark Schaefer, but here we go. Uh, it seems to be sort of like what Mark is talking about when he says, you know, like exposing a seam, like a seam has opened up and you're, you know, maybe that's a seam where, you know, holy cow, you've, you've, you see that the energy transition, companies and players in that field are really lacking in the capability to communicate with, with their stakeholders, you know, and I I think it's, it sounds to me that, and having spent a little bit of time in that, in, with some of those, um, some of those organizations, uh, you know, they're very startup-y, right? They're very like, you know, kind of almost some of them almost kind of moving forward under the assumption that everybody believes in what they do and why should I worry about it too much? Because I'm on the side of good and I'm on the side of right. So you're on, you have to be on board with me. Um, and sometimes maybe they forget a business is a business or, you know, there are alternatives to what they're selling, right? Even within the renewables area there, you know, fine, we can all get on board with the mission of cleaning the world and, and getting to net zero, but do we do it with wind? Do we do it with hydrogen? Do we do it with carbon capture? Do we do it with what? You know, like probably all the above, but anyway, so I, my point is, I think that there's a tremendous need in that world, you know? Yeah, to, there is. You know, I agree. And one of the things actually that we found was in terms of a, of a seam um, within this space even was that businesses in the energy transition, and even in particular, let's, let's take uh, green hydrogen as an example they're needing to scale rapidly they're, they're, these are companies that are going from the current size today to 5x or 10x of of you know where they are now even just in a few years so the 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 pace of scale is um, substantial and so what that means on the internal uh, culture and values of a company, the internal dimensions that that people care about, was also an area that we looked at. And said, you know, we need to be able to come alongside a business that is a hundred people now, but based on their funding and project pipeline, they're going to need to be a thousand in just a few years. That puts tremendous amount of strain on the values and the culture and the internal comms pieces of, of, of that business. And so that was another dimension that we looked at and said, 
that that's an area for us that we have expertise in that we want to be able to serve. That's, it's, and I think people forget about that. People overlook the fact that, you know, when a company grows or when organizations change, well, of course, you know, they're going to grow and they're going to bring people on. Everybody's going to be excited to be there, but that's not always the case. You know, the founding culture sometimes changes and hopefully the founding values don't, but maybe they evolve a little bit, you know, um, they certainly would over time, but you know, this, you always hear that this success factor, the key success factor to so many, um, startups that make it is that the leaders come in, but the founders have such rock solid values and don't divert from those and find like-minded people who are who buy into it. And there is a sort of agreement on purpose, uh, which you know, again, the magic P word is a purpose and, and, and that, and they can all move forward together on that. Now organizations grow and change. Um, and you no, know, not everybody's always going to be uh, in the same place. So I'm, I can, you know, I, I, I totally see the value of, of helping growing firms and scaling firms to ensure that that's going to be, that, 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 that that's going to happen. Yeah. And also the, you know, just to, to dovetail on that, I mean, uh, for us, it's very much a kind of, um, inside out dynamic here where one of the things that we've done with one of our clients even is, you know, they came in and said, well, can you guys help us, um, with some external work, you know, some external comms work, thought leadership work. So yeah, we could do that. But actually, would you mind if we took a look at some things internally first? We just want to make sure that before we go out with a different tack from a messaging point of view externally, that that's going to jive with the culture and sort of the lived experience internally so that there's not a mismatch there. And we often see that, of course, in our line of work that, you know, a company's internal culture and experience from an employee point of view is radically different and from the external messaging that's put out into the world. So when employees see that ad for their company, they're like, yeah, that's BS. <laughs> You know, we're like, ah, that doesn't resonate with me at all. And so we just wanted to kind of monitor that. And so we just want to make sure. And really good thing we did because we were able to identify some things that we needed to clean up a little bit internally first. And I just think that's a really important thing to keep in mind in comms to say, let's make sure that we're doing our best to have continuity and alignment between the internal experience and the external uh, sort of messaging. You know, it's, it's, you bring up a really interesting point that as a, you know, professionally speaking, um, has, has been kind of a, an issue in our industry, I think, um, well, certainly on the corporate side for as long as there's been corporations probably, which is that, um, internal communications and employee engagement was always kind of the also ran, right. The last kind of, you know, well, we don't need to you know, what's so hard about putting together a newsletter or, you know, if the CEO wants to talk to people, he can just get up and talk to people. Um, and it wasn't until quite recently, I think that, you know, the smart companies and, uh, you know, maybe it has to do with sort of employer employee empowerment and the fact that people can move and change jobs. I mean, even in bad economies, they still ultimately can leave. Um, so it's wise that companies start to look at their employees as stakeholders. You know, whenever you do a stakeholder map and, you know, PR people understand what that is, comms people understand what that is, uh, you know, community, uh, marketing people. But, you know, when you're, whenever you're trying to figure out who it is that you need to talk to and who the important audiences are for your product, for your business, for your service, you know, for your purpose. So many people leave employees out in that first swipe. And it's crazy. The employees are probably the, the number, the first. And I like the way that you put that first. And, and I have to say, look, mea culpa on this one, because like I, I prided myself on being an external kind of marketer and communicator and, and internal comms was always something that was like lower down the value chain. Um, in recent years, I have completely flipped my, my tune on this, that internal comms is first of all, difficult. Um, you know, just because you're talking to your employees does not mean that the same, you know, kind of rules of good communication don't apply, you know, and you want to make sure that your employees are like, well, first to make sure that they're fulfilled, if not happy, or, you know, at least they, they, they get joy out of what they do. Um, 
but they, that they're on board with what you, where you're going, you know, and clear out uncertainty, have, you know, have them feel like they're contributing and part of the community and make your, your, your work into a community. And, um, you'll get a lot more, uh, loyalty. You'll get a lot more, uh, feedback and certainly productivity, right? I mean, all goes hand in hand, but, uh, anyway, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of preaching to the choir looking at, you know, no, no, I think but. it's a great point. I mean, to me, I completely agree. I mean, I, I think I I've also done a, a real reversal in this, in this area over the last several years. And I think part of it is, and it happened a while ago, but, but tech kind of broke down the barrier. There was this wall that we companies used to have, but between the internal culture and then the external face, right? And companies could hide behind that wall and they didn't really care about the disparity between the two because that wall was very, very thick and impenetrable. So, but tech broke all that down. And so now you don't have an internal announcement and an external announcement. You have an yeah. announcement, right? Yeah. So, so I think that's also facilitated a lot of this emphasis on internal and, and I love it. I, I'm with you. I love the challenge of, of, yeah. of, you know, applying what we know to employees. It's, it's a really, um, yeah, it gives me a lot of energy. Yeah. I like that. I like what you said about, about the tech break down the barrier, you know, it changes the leverage, uh, formula. And, and I was talking to this, talking about this with, with somebody recently, it's like, well, you know, why do we have to, somebody said, why do we have to kowtow to employees all the time? So look, first you shouldn't be kowtowing to employees, right? It should, there should be a mutual relationship here. And, you know, you know, there's, power dynamic is a, is a, is a difficult thing to solve for, but if there is a power dynamic, then there's something, there's an issue in the culture. So you have to kind of work that out, but you know, you want to lead with respect and you want to lead by example and you want to lead because you're on the, you know, the right, the right purpose together. But, you know, still when things are out of whack or out of balance, you know, your employees have the ability to go out and talk about whatever you're doing anywhere externally with no fear. Pretty much. I mean, we hope we're hope with no fear and you want them to talk about the good stuff. Right. Um, but when you um, when your employee comes or when your kind of employee engagement is, is off whack, you know, the employee empowerment is such a critical piece, you know, because you have to re realize that, you know, they're, they're a force. And maybe the most, the most trusted force as well. People trust employees who work at a company more than they trust the media, more than they trust the CEO. They just credit to Edelman on this one. It's, it's just a, it is a fact. Um, so, you know, we need to really be, be focused on it. But what I was thinking is like in, particularly in the, uh, in the, in, in companies in green transition and in the industries that you're working in, which is sort of reminiscent of the early tech days, I suppose, with like the kind of like people just doing a lot of cool shit and thinking they can get away with it, right? Um, employees probably want to crow about what they're doing, right? They want to really talk about, we have the coolest solution and, and either they're not able to for whatever reasons, or, you know, if they get angry, they say it the wrong way or they can really screw, screw over the company or, you know, make big, big, they could be that pivotal person that changes the course of everything just because of the nature of where you are in the, in the, in the development cycle. So, for your clients is, do you find that to be like a particularly strong issue that in, in, you know, more, maybe even more than some of the larger established enterprises have? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, uh, what you're saying resonates just so much uh, with me because uh, we actually just had a client meeting recently where we compared employees to kind of nuclear material where it was like, <laughs> look guys, you know, it was like, look, it's, it is either really, really good or it can be really, really devastating. And you have to treat it with that kind of care and attention and sensitivity. And if you're able to do that and you're able to engage employees properly and communicate with them with empathy and understanding and make sure that they're heard and all of those things we care about um, in terms of employee engagement, then they will be your biggest fan. They will be your biggest advocate. They will shout from the rooftops how wonderful it is to work there. And that is even from a selfish point of view, from just a crass marketing point of view, you can't buy that. You have hundreds or thousands of employees that are singing your praises. That is invaluable. So I think that, you know, we certainly see that for sure. And in renewables, it's interesting because it's, you know, renewables, it's a long game. 
And what we're doing in the renewable energy space and really any company in the energy transition, um, so I include MHI in this, obviously, with their portfolio. Yeah. You know, we're planting seeds here for, I don't remember how the expression goes, but some, something like we're planting seeds here for trees that our kids and grandkids will be able to sit under. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not going to be sitting under that shade. That That's going to be for the next generation. And and it's a transition and it's yeah. a transition for the entire global energy infrastructure so it takes a long time and and i think for for us um that's that doesn't need to be discouraging that needs to be inspiring so we need to be hopeful and inspired by progress even if it's slower than we want and that means that we as marketers as comms people need to be infused with that kind of positivity and energy when we go out to employees or external audiences or whatever it is to say yeah maybe it's not going as fast as we want but we are making progress the world is essentially behind us most of the world is behind us here we have a lot of momentum and yeah, the global energy mix right now is still predominantly fossil fuel. That is the truth. Um, but I think it's really important that we find a way to live in that in that tension. There's there's a tension between keeping your head in the clouds, stay dreamy, stay passionate, stay you know on fire for the cause, you know, and all of that, but also keep our feet on the ground, be rooted and grounded in reality that this is going to be a slog. And there are interests that don't want this to happen on their watch. Of course. And that's true. And so I think there's a tension there that we we will not be able to reconcile cleanly. So we have to live with it and we have to find inspiration in it. There's a there's a a, a difficult kind of contradiction or not contradiction. There's, there's a there's certainly a dilemma here. Um you're you're in especially in this particular space in the when we're talking about renewables, you know, it's, it attracts that whole, the whole industry will attract people naturally who are passionate about that issue, which as we know now in the world we live in, you cannot find almost, it's almost impossible to find something that people are more passionate about than climate change. Um, and you know, the road to get there, as you just said, right. It's a long one. Um, And there are so many different paths that are all going in that direction. We just do not know which is the right or the best one. We do. We don't. There's no way to tell. But we can tell probably now that there's a lot of good ones. Right. And I think the the dilemma is to deal with like the difference between impatience and inspiration. And how can companies, how can how can leaders How can we communicators and marketers be inspirational and counteract the natural impatience of people who are like, hey, the world's burning. What's what's going on versus the people who are saying, yes, but the trends are good, right? Because they are. The trends are good. And we can't, you know, we we have so much, there's so much doom scrolling and uh, what do they call it? Uh, Disaster porn and uh, you know, everybody's hair is on fire all the time. And maybe it's a function of generation. I don't know. Um, we were saying earlier, the two of us are like right smack dab in the Gen X where it's like, you know, we could care. I mean, this we care about, but you know what I mean? Like we're, we're very, we're like, you know, we have a very, uh, a very um, embedded ambivalence, I think around a lot of things, but like, you know, you get impatient about stuff and these, uh, the, the folks who are really passionate and working in, in the renewable field or in any of the kind of climate change related industries, you know, good, awesome. So, so glad they're doing that, but they need to be able to see the bigger picture. And that is not, or not and, and that bigger picture doesn't mean you have to love, you know, or even like, or remotely kind of even acknowledge, uh, you know, natural gas, for instance, Right. But you do have to understand that it doesn't matter what you wish for, you know, <laughs> what, what is it? If, if wishes were fishes, I forget the whole the expression, but, <laughs> but you know, right. You know, hope, hope is not a strategy. It's just, you, you know, this is the reality. How do you, cha- how do you affect change right through your, through what you're doing, like focus in your area and your product 
your like if it's offshore wind, what are you doing with wind? If you're if it's solar, great. Nuclear, which you know is goes to, there's different you know kind of uh, perspectives on nuclear, but you know no question that it is a it is a carbon zero uh, uh, no emissions solution. You know where are you on EVs versus hydrogen cars? What like where is all this stuff? There's they're all good things, right? You know, yeah. but there's a lot of impatience there. Yeah, there is, and I think one of the things that I I told my team at MHI uh, Vestas uh, a couple of years ago was, you know, we need to live with the urgency of our environmentalist friends who are on one side of the spectrum who are just nothing but just passion and zeal and urgency, and we need them. We need that group of people in the world. Yeah, we need to live with that urgency and operate with that urgency. But we we also need to hold that with the pragmatic view on the technology and the the sort of engineering side of life, the practicalities of of this transition, and we need to be able to hold both of those in balance and occupy both. We can't; it's not choosing one or the other. We have to be able to live in both, communicate um, sort of both of those dimensions as we put our work out into the world. And if we don't do that, if we tend towards one side or the other too much, this is my opinion here. But I mean, if we go one way or the other, then I think we're we're not optimal because I think there's some there's some real significant pros and cons to both of those sides. So we need to kind of take the best of both, blend it together and find inspiration. The fact that it's a transition that takes a long time should yeah. not be a discouragement. It should just be a reality that we try to accelerate. We try to speed it up as much as we can. Of course, there's things politicians can do to speed up the permitting and the you know project life cycle for these projects. I mean, there's a million things we we could we are calling for in the industry. And that's important that we continue to do that. But at the end of the day, the expectation should be that this is an energy transition, not an energy uh, overnight fix. And you know, just one one other point was <clears throat> my my both of my grandfathers worked in fossil fuel uh, production, and so I come from a fossil fuel family and background. And you know, back then they 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 that was the solution that you're powering the world. I mean, to them there was no moral dilemma back in the you know. 50s and 60s sure. <laughs> as far as we, the kind of energy that was being produced and consumed. And so they worked in an industry that they thought was very beneficial to humanity. And mm-hmm. I don't fault them for that. And I and I feel like we now have an enlightened view. We have progressed forward. We understand that there's better ways to do things now. And so we're doing the best we can. Like you said, how do you feel about EV? How do you feel about hydrogen and all these different solutions? For me personally, I love them all. Let's try them all. Let's see which ones end up winning this Darwinian battle in the end. Yeah. And we need to hold all of them with an open hand. Because you know what? Probably 50 or 100 years from now, there's going to be a lot of people, maybe even the predominant mindset, that what were we thinking back in 2020? Like, oh my God. <laughs> What, what, why were they why were they thinking that was a good idea? So I mean, I think we also need to kind of step back a little bit and say throughout the arc of history, we're doing the best we can here with the information we know, just like they were a hundred years ago. Yeah, you, you, if you scale back, if you pull back uh, you know to whatever thirty thousand a hundred thousand feet, you can see trends in different parts of our world that are going the wrong way or some are going the right way. But on the whole, you know, uh, people are better off now than they've ever been in the history of, of humanity. Uh, and a lot of that is because of the benefits, it's primarily because of the benefits of energy and power, no matter how it was gotten, ill-gotten or not, from the um, you know, 19th and, and, and 20th centuries. You know, and now like, okay, we, we, we got the power. We, the, the, actually, the, when I mean power, I don't mean like political power. I mean like, energy, electricity, power, you know, right. so we, the, the, we, we are, we're able to power our homes and our cars and we got air conditioning and, you know, Hey, that led to long lifespans and better health and people can be heated in the winter time. And, Oh, that led to even more better, you know, more better lifespans and better health. And yeah. Okay. There's some, you know, we, we're, we're certain shooting some 
bad crap up into the air. We can deal with that later. Okay. But now we're ready to deal with that. And we're dealing with that and you know, we're reducing this and adding, making sure that things are better and getting better. But you can't, you can't deny that it was that, that availability of power that improved humanity to such a degree. And now we're at the, this cusp of this new, tra- of this new generation or this new, you know, the transition as, as we've been calling it, where not only can we, can we get that power and we can bring it to you know, the, the folks in sub-Saharan Africa, Africa, for example, like that you were mentioned before, um, do it cheaper. We could do it better. We could do it more efficiently and hopefully we could do it cleanly. And, and it's that cleanly part that still requires a lot of time and investment, but we're getting there. And, um, you know, I see, I'm very optimistic about this whole thing. I, and as you know, like working at MHI, frankly, helped me a lot with this, um, because I could see very clearly that, you know, there's a mix of solutions available. Um, it was awesome to go out to, um, to see offshore wind turbines being built, uh, the technology and just the, the, the joy of the people who are doing it were amazing, but it was equally cool to see how gas turbines were being improved and changed over so that they could use, you know, more friendly, like less lower emissions mixes, because that's going to get us there, you know? So like it's, it's and carbon capture. Wow. You know, to me, it was just like, you know, big thing. And, you know, I left before the hydrogen stuff really took off, but Really fascinating. And the reality yeah. is, too, and I think being at MHI with you, by the way, was such a great experience for me um, to be able to see that portfolio and see how you guys were able to, and, and I'll just give a short plug yeah. um, on, on your work here, because I feel in my experience there that you and your team were incredibly instrumental in bringing MHI's energy business to another level of awareness and you know, you had some great agency partners. You guys were doing really good work together, your team, and you 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 seem to be a, a a really wonderful facilitator in that role. You brought the right people into the right room at the right time, and Thank and you. I think MHI, I see MHI's energy business now in the public sphere, and I always think of you and your team. So well done. Thank <laughs> you, man. Um, yeah, and, and but what I want to say too about about MHI is that. The interesting thing for people who are not in the energy transition, who are listening to this, I'll, I'll say this. We will need natural gas for a very, very, very long time. No one listening to this will outlive that need. <laughs> uh, it's that long. I mean, you have a baseload energy supply that you need to have. And renewables are wonderful. I'm in the business. I'm a believer. I'm all in. I'm in that camp. But you need, you, we are going to be needing natural gas as cleanly supplied as possible for a very, very long time. And if you talk to people in the energy transition who are practical, who understand the engineering behind it, who get all the different market dynamics, they will agree. Yeah. So that's not a popular view on the environmentalist side of things on that, from that crowd. But, you know, that we draw inspiration from them. But we also draw inspiration from the pra- pragmatism of people who understand the technology. Yeah. And of course, this is notwithstanding any potential technological innovations and developments that we you know we you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. But the the chances are we're going to be living with with natural gas and and you know, and man, might I add, like the way that natural gas is used and processed and everything is more and more and more and more efficient every single day or year or whatever. So, you know, you're getting less and less of the bad stuff. Although there's always, there's bad stuff, no question. Right. So it's the trade-offs. It's all about trade-offs, you know, um, I, like, I, I can keep talking about that stuff and, and I'm, thank you so much for your comments about MHI. You know, what occurred to me though, is as you were, t- as you were talking about that, it's like, we were talking about earlier, uh, earlier, how those making those human connections, you know, those empathy based human connections that are pivotal in your life. Um, it's this, it, it's that fundamental thing about being open to it, right? Like you have to be, you have to have an open mind, whatever you call it, listen to the universe, um, and get those dots going and then kind of make those connections on a macro level. It's the same thing for these companies, right? Like, and for, for, for the, for the people in whatever industry, you know, the successful kind of operation unit organization company is going to be like approaching what they do with an expansive worldview 
right? That's going to be open to understanding the inputs that they receive and seeing where those connections lie rather than shutting things off and shutting things away. They, there's most of it will be completely inappropriate to what you do. And you just kind of, you know, shove it aside, but everything that comes in, ask yourself, where can I connect this and how can I connect this? You know, great or can point. I connect it? You know, great it's kind of, great kind of the way I feel about things. Which, Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a really interesting point, you know, because I, one of the things I've, I've been uh, preaching primarily to myself um, and anyone who will listen, but is, is this idea of bringing, bringing peripheral interests into your work. Interesting. And I wrote, I published a piece about this recently about this idea that your work is made better, not worse, but it's made better by incorporating your peripheral interests. Well, first of all, cultivating peripheral interests. And I don't care, it could be anything. It could be gardening, could be surfing, could be whatever. But by being creative and being open and living in this sort of spirit of integrity, and what I mean by that is like integrating, right? Your life and all the different dimensions of your life. Our work as creative people is made better by drawing inspiration from different parts of life. And, and that, that requires that openness that you're talking about. So if you are open, then it's not a stretch to think that, hey, I'm going to draw some inspiration or some illustration or metaphor or something from this part of my life. And it may be kind of funky or kind of funny or weird, but hey, it, it's making a really great point. And I love when people do that, where there's that natural flow of, of uh, you know, stories and illustrations and inspiration from different parts of life. And I think that makes our work much better. So I really, I'm a big fan of, you know, sort of integrating peripheral interests into, into what we're doing. And I have said, you're singing my song. I, I've, I've often tried to figure out what the hell it is that I'm doing here on the podcast. Right. And one of the things that I'm doing here on the podcast is like, actually like what is peripheral and tangential to what I do on a day-to-day basis. It, what's going to make my life richer and better and strong and, and kind of make me a better employee, make me a better friend, make me a better leader, husband, father, you know, all these things are very, very, are, are, it's, it's kind of wrong to put that, to say that they're peripheral interests because they should be central interests in your life, but, but they're peripheral to what you do and what you focus on on a day-to-day level. So I like to think that this is a, uh, you know, people go through life with blinders on often and they don't, especially per- professional life with blinders on and don't kind of consider those sidetracks and those roads. And, you know, you need to take them down and be aware of the, ch- the tangents because then and only then will you understand that you're on the right path or maybe you'll find a better path for yourself. I don't know. I like to keep it. Oh, geez, I'm really getting philosophical this morning. This this morning. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, I, I hear you, man. I'm, I'm with you. Know, you. And, and I know that like, like we've been talking for an hour I, we, and, and we, we probably should wrap it down, r- wrap it up soon. I just wanted to, before we go, and I got to say, I've been having so much fun in this conversation. Um, like it's not a surprise because we've, you know, we've connected before and, and, you know, we, I, I knew that we were like-minded in a lot of ways, but um. I wanted to know, like, you've started a firm, a business, you know, with another one of our, of my dear colleagues, ex-colleagues, Barrett, Barrett Road is just, oh gosh, so delightful. And with, and with your wife, you know, you have, it's a family business. You've got to, to a point, um, it's a tight knit group, right? I would imagine that you're pretty agile and, and mobile and, you know, flexible. And that's one of the things that you guys bring into your, your client engagements, you know, and I know you have other people that are, that you rely on and work with and so on, but um, what are the things that are happening in the world now that are sort of, you think are affecting the way that you do business maybe, or that are keeping you up at night and, you know, like, you know, it, how, how are they affecting or how do you think that, that you can leverage something to, to, you know, to bring your clients a better, better service? Mm, hmm well, that's a great question. I think one thing for me, uh, because I'm a writer uh, and uh, not I'm not a classically trained writer. I didn't go to school for journalism, but um, I've been writing and and um, uh, I've been paid for my writing since I was nine years old. Wow, I didn't so, know that. So, so <laughs> in third grade, um, I was I was a, a big fan of our speech competitions Mm -hmm. as a kid growing up it was a weird thing but i was and one of the categories of speech competition were was that you could write your own 
a poem or you could write your own story and then deliver it as a speech, or you could just take one off the shelf and, and, and memorize it. Well, I like to do the, the, the category of writing your own speech and then delivering it because nobody was in that category. So it was usually like me and one other guy. So I, I didn't have to beat that many people to, to sort of advance. Yeah. And, but I love writing. And so I started doing this year after year and third grade, uh, second grade, third grade. And then uh, some kids decided that they wanted to join that category, but they didn't want to write their speeches. And so I offered to them that I would write their speech for them and they would just go deliver it. And of course it was all under, you know, it was all dark money. <laughs> Your nine-year-old corrupt self. It was underground, uh, but I collected cash. Sometimes I took milk or orange juice, uh, but, but I, I've always loved writing. And I think one of the things that's impacting us now in particular is, is AI technology. And I love it. I'm all for it. Yeah. I think that the innovation, the progress is insane. I think it's just like off the charts crazy. It's so, so great. But yeah, I have had some pause, I think, a little bit in, in the conversation over the last few weeks or last few months. Um, and it, I guess for me, uh, my feeling is that writing or painting even or music the the final work, you know, the final expression that you deliver is only a, in my opinion, a peripheral benefit. I think that the the primary joy and beauty in any human expression, like writing or painting or music, is in the discovery. Yeah. You know, I think you become more of you. You become a better version of you through the process. So I think it's in the journey it's in the creative process where you're exploring a topic, you're researching, you're absorbing, you're digging, trying and failing, trying again. It's such a proactive and human process. It's tiring, but it's it's wonderful. Um, and I think part of what my concern is that if we lean too far into something like chat GPT to take over that process too much, um, I, I worry a bit about that because I think we become wiser, more educated on a variety of topics when we go through all the preparation to write about it. And so in yeah. that way, the final piece that you end up with, the book or the blog post or whatever, is really, uh, that's kind of a peripheral benefit. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of, in, there's a lot of people that, and, and you know, probably more about this than, than I do, but I think the million dollar question is, will AI such as chat GPT, for example, replace writers? Will they replace artists? Mm -hmm. And I think some people are out there saying, yeah, absolutely. Like quit yeah. your job, quit your job. If you're a writer, quit now. <laughs> and others are taking a more pragmatic approach and say, okay, well, maybe AI tools can do some heavy lifting. Maybe they can do a first draft. Then humans come in after and then kind of tinker with it to get to a final draft. I tend to agree more with the second opinion. I think that it will probably be a great tool to boost augment writing. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the more we stay in control of the process, the better the outcome will be. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because good writing creates a powerful connection between two people. I mean, at the at the heart of writing, at the heart of communicating and connection is truth and empathy. Both people have to have a commitment to the truth, to reality. And when it's done well in a professional setting, it's because the author knows the audience. And so engagement in that way is it becomes this sort of two-way dance between the writer and the reader. And, you know, it's like when you feel that feeling that, that someone just gets you, they, they're, they're like writing to you, like they have a camera in your house or your office, they just totally get what you're going through. That level of engagement, that release of oxytocin even is such a powerful connection that's made. And I think that fundamentally, AI, even with its insane ability to churn out these beautiful sentences and yeah. or paintings, even, I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, it misses something deeper here. And I think that if you think about writing is about the audience and it's about a connection that's made on a foundation of, you know, truth and experience, AI doesn't care about truth. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it's agnostic to that. I was reading a few weeks ago, an interesting article actually on, on mind matters and uh, Peter Biles wrote this piece and he closed the article with a great line. It was something like 
AI can crank out nice sentences in a cogent argument or, or even a, a piece of art, but it has no commitment to the truth. Mm. It has no commitment to you. Yeah, it's true. I feel like if we stay in control of the process, then I think it's, it's awesome. I think we should embrace it as much as we can. I'm on board with, with almost everything that, that you're saying, well, pretty much, pretty much everything you're saying. I, I have been digging in deeper. I think there are some incredible uses that we haven't uncovered yet, but I know that there's a lot of great ways to use, whether it's chat GPT or Dolly or whatever it is, like any of these kind of, any of these generative AI tools, there's a lot of things that we can do to enhance our, uh, our abilities to, to, you know, kind of help us over some hurdles here and there and really fantastic for accessibility, like for people who have dyslexia or for people who have very, very difficult times, you know, editing or spelling, or even, you know, uh, folks who have, you know, everybody tells you that spelling is not a sign of intelligence, but if you, I'll tell you like, and I can spell, I have always been a great speller. So I don't know what this says about me, but what I can tell you is that I know lots of people who, who feel super embarrassed and, you know, like, Oh, I can't believe I keep spelling that one wrong. Or, or, you know, you have those, those snobs out there who, who, who yell at people when they put the apostrophe in the wrong place. Look, if you're a professional editor and you hand me something where the apostrophe is in the wrong place, then I have every right to be a snob to you. But if you're just like somebody who's posting something on, you know, on social media and you're like, you're like, it's, it's Y-O-U-R instead of Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, you know, I, who's going to be a dick and say apostrophe dude, you know, like, right, right. There's a lot of trolls out there who are. So I think that, yeah. that, the, that the generous, the, the, a, a good use of these tools is to sort of say, okay, I realize that I have a, uh, a something that is, is part of like as a deficiency, let's say in my, in my writing, and this will help me. Um, so I think it's a lifesaver in that ways. And certainly for people who, who have, who have accessibility issues, people who, who can't organize stuff, you know, it, it's helpful, but in the end, you're right. It has to be a human. And you know, the, the point that you're making, the, the way you use it, what, if you're doing writing, um, your ideas have to be yours. There's a lot to be said about, you know, approaching the, approaching the AI as, okay, fine. It's going to write something. It's going to write it well, but it is an extremely junior staffer. So I'm going to have to direct it and give it all kinds of questions. And you play the role of a journalist and like dig and dig and dig and dig. And you can spend just as much time asking it questions and getting that thing to refine something as you would to write the original draft itself. You know, so there's, it's not that you're, that there's less effort. It's just a different kind of effort. Yeah, that's right. And then when it comes, yeah. And then when it comes out, you know, but no, but that's, that's the thing. Like who's doing that, right? A lot of people are just saying, oh, hey, write me this and they do it and they hand it in and it sucks. Um, you know, but I've, I've found it to be a useful tool in a lot of ways. And I think I'm just, I'm just scratching the surface. I particularly love the idea of it being able to, you know, give you code, um, and you know, like Excel formulas. I'm, yeah, I yeah, have had a board. lifelong <laughs> hatred of that. And um, yeah, yeah exactly. Too. So yeah, for, yeah. for, for, for when it's outside of your normal skill set, now I'm able to enhance my skill set with some things that, Normally I'd have to go and find somebody else to do for me. Now I can just do them. Um, it's all good. I mean, but I agree with you. There's, you know, in the end, it's a human to human connection with the writing, you know, and I didn't think of it that way. And we benefit from yeah. the process of researching for a piece. If you're writing a piece, absolutely, you're writing a book, you're writing, you know, something, the journey you take to create that makes you better, makes yeah. you smarter. So if you shortcut that, it's great. It's awesome. Are you kidding? It's like, it's super, mm -hmm. super efficient. I mean, who wouldn't yeah. do that? But I think there is something that's lost there that we have to kind of figure out. We have to consider that here in the discussion. Yeah. It's a situational thing. And mm. just like anything else, you know, you're going to have people who are going to try to, you know, use it in situations where, you know, it's going to short shrift them in the long run. Um, but look, I hope that's that we have the wisdom to to kind of say, all right, it's here. We're doing something with it. Let's see how we can better, you know, uh, uh, embed it and sort of like embrace it and learn to drive it rather than let it drive us. Um, and I think there's a there's a fair number of people who are doing that. Um, but I haven't seen I have never seen anything take such a I have never seen anything be adopted so fast and hit us like wildfire. And I think what you said at the very beginning of that, of, of this part of the, of our conversation, you know, some people are going to have, are going to, you know, should quit their jobs and just because this, I think that's true. I think, I think now more than any, more than at any time 
if you're trying to be a writer, and I don't mean a writer of fiction, although maybe, but if you're trying to be a writer, you know, there's a point at which you have to just sort of say, I, I suck at this, right? I'm never going to be a good writer. Right. Because there, because you know, you know, and I know we're exposed to people who have been doing it for 10 years. Like, oh, I wish you would have found a different job. And that's a terrible thing to say, but I really like, it just, it just saps your life away when you get a poor piece of writing from somebody who's supposed to be a pro. So look, yes, I really hope that earlier in your career, when you're stuck writing some, you know, some summaries and basic stuff, let chat GP, let chat GPT do it instead of you and, you know, learn to be a, a better writer sooner. Um, or, acknowledge, Hey, okay, fine. Somebody, there's no biz, there's no career in this for me now. So I'm going to go do something else and find your real, you know, where you really can contribute, you know? Um, so there's, there's a positive side to that. It'll save all of us editors, a lot of headaches, you know? Absolutely. And you know, I don't see it as a, you know, I I saw an article recently about the comparison between spell check when that first mm, came out versus, versus a, a, a chat GBT type of a solution now where, you know, back in the, back when spell check came out, there was a lot of, um, hand wringing around that. Like, yeah. Oh, this is cheating. This is yeah. going to deprive people of their you know ability <laughs> to crazy. spell, blah, blah, blah. Well now, of course, it, I mean, it's a tool we all need. We love it. We use it. Yeah. And so I, I think in many ways, you know, this is not a, this is not a cheating tool. This is a tool that can augment and support us in substantial ways, really fundamental ways. Oh, and I think it's just a matter of like almost kind of in a way, being selfish with your own learning. Like, hey, no, mm-hmm. I, no, actually, you know what? I want to dig into that topic. Like, I want to yeah. write that because I need to know it. And if there's other times where, okay, maybe I don't really need to know that. So I'm just going to crank it out and boom, yeah. that's going to help me. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's very situational. Yep. And, you know, yes, I would, we wouldn't encourage somebody to, to not go gain the knowledge that they need to gain. Um, you know, but you want to want to gain that knowledge anyway, I would think. And you're still going to have to do the reading. You're still going to have to do the checking, you know, and just knowing that it's not always accurate. You have to, you really have to be on top of your game as you go through whatever output you get from it. Um, but that's, just, that's now who knows what happens with GPT four, who knows what happens with whatever other AI are coming down the pike. And, and we're just, talk, we're just talking about that generative text to AI. I mean, I love, I am having fun with it all. You know, I really am. And, uh, and um, I would never in a billion years ever claim to have one ounce of graphic design or artistry in my blood. But some of the stuff that I'm churning out using like mid journey and Dolly is like, this is some cool shit. Insane. It's wild. I mean, I wouldn't use it for my company, but it's insane, you know? So <laughs> right, right. it's a lot of fun, but um, it is. I, I, I realize we could, again, we could go forever on this, but in, um, you know, in your, in your world, I'm sure you're going to see a lot more and more of this, especially because you know, uh, the energy transition and companies in transition tend to be a little more technologically forward. Um, and, you know, in the rush to, to move us forward, uh, you know, you tend to adopt some tools a little more quickly than others, maybe, and, you know, something to be vigilant for, I suppose. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to say one thing on that. I, I, I love this piece. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know. We're, we're recording this at the, uh, what are we at? End of February here. Yeah. Um, and, and a few weeks back I saw on LinkedIn, um, a woman shared her story where she asked chat GPT to discuss the carbon credit, uh, <laughs> controversy. Do you see that? Uh, the carbon uh, credit yeah. sort of controversy and sort of nature based solutions in Shakespearean style. <laughs> and then what she, in Shakespearean style, give me the carbon credit controversy pros and cons. And it was brilliant. It was, was like, brilliant. are you kidding me? It was insane. So I thought, okay, you know, it clearly this, it, we are in a whole nother world now. We it's are. like, there was pre uh, this type of power and now there's the rest of oh, the yeah. rest of the way forward. That's a great use. You know, if you want to persuade somebody and you don't have the capability to write like Shakespeare, why, why not? You know, exactly. um, there's, there's a lot going on there. You know, there's still, it, we still have to remember that it doesn't cover anything past 2021 and that, um, you know, there have been developments since then, surprise, surprise in all kinds of technology, um, and books written since then and, and billions of words written since then. So vigilance, I think, uh, fact checking, you know, don't let it fact check for you. Uh, I've seen it already go bad. 
Uh, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a great, I don't know. We're, we're at a very, very exciting time for our industry, but you know, look, you and me, we are of the same age. Uh, and you know, we have the benefit of having, you know, a couple decades behind us and being at a point in our career where, where we're not going to be displaced by any of this stuff. Um, because we're, you know, and I don't say this in a way that's just because it's like, because I'm trying to be, you know, snobby or hierarchical, but we're higher up the value chain. So, you know, we earned that we moved there, we got there. Right. So I just hope that these technologies don't push people out of our value chain. And instead that folks who are kind of working out how to really compete almost with this, figure out how to do that. And humans have always been good at that always. So I'm very hopeful. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm going to, I'm going to leave it, Michael, uh, at that. Um, but man, um, I've, I've so enjoyed this conversation and I want to check back with you soon, you know, to see how engagement lab is doing. Um, uh, I know that our, our readers, our, our listeners are going to want to know more about you. So everybody, please go find Michael Morris on LinkedIn. Now there's a lot of Michael Morris's on LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, go to the one that's connected to me or, um, find, you know, Michael Morris and like search for engagement lab. And, and, you know, uh, there's, I don't know if there's many Michael Morris's who are in Denmark. So, um, maybe that's the key <laughs> Look for Michael Morris in Denmark. Um, and, um, you know, uh, check him. I, I know that you're not too, super active on, on other social channels necessarily, Michael, but do you have, um, an, an engagement lab is, is still building its, its, um, its infrastructure, but do you have, um, a website where people should go to see you, to see more about you? We are building it as we speak and should be launching it soon. So hopefully by the time this airs, it'll be, uh, it'll be live, but, uh, if not, it'll be engagementlab.com when we get there. So engagementlab.com. Yeah. Heard it here, folks. Engagementlab.com, Michael Morris on LinkedIn. Um, Michael, any any last, last words before we go? No, I, I'm I'm just grateful to you. I I, I love the conversation, had a had a blast. And uh, like I said, I, I've always loved working with you. And and you said something about this podcast that was really interesting to me, and that is that it's it's bringing in lots of elements of your life and these seemingly peripheral, but in some ways very central. Uh, things in your life. And I love what you're doing. So keep doing it. Thanks, man. It's it's really wonderful work you're doing. Well, I'm so glad it gave us a chance to really sit down and talk for a long time because we haven't done that in ages. And, um, you know, I will hopefully catch up with you again real soon. And everybody out there, again, uh, Michael Morris, Engagement Lab, please do read up on the energy, energy transition, the green transition. You know, I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done bringing companies organizations uh, up to speed and being able to tell their stories to people who are believers, who are sort of in the middle, who aren't believers. There's a lot that we need to do and that should be done uh, in communications and marketing for the green transition. And Michael and his team are, I think, great choices for you guys to, for you out there to, to, to give a holler to and see what they got to say if you have such needs. So everybody, thank you so much uh, for listening. And Michael, thanks for, for being such a great guest. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thanks for listening to the Dan Nessel Show. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. You know, people always ask me, why do I do the show? I do it for the ratings. I do it for your validation. So do me a favor. Go over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or someplace else, wherever you're listening to podcasts, and subscribe, leave a review, rate me, and share with your friends. Anything you can do to spread the word, I deeply appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to The Dan Nessel Show.